Welcome back. This is Professor Emily Seal covering chapters 11 and 12 and uh, well we're, we're going to time travel today so we'll uh, like Bill and Ted kind of jump around between chapters uh, in order to kind of condense and be more concise uh, in talking about theater history. Theater history to me is like getting to travel. You get to sort of imagine this bygone era. It helps reflect on the culture, which is a big theme of this class, is what can we learn about a group of people based on the stories they celebrate and uh, what ch kinds of stories they choose to tell. Uh, how can we tell what they know about God, about what they say about relationships, based on these kind of s stories that they're telling. Um, that said, this... Uh, particular textbook is way more in-depth in theater history than any textbook I've ever dealt with before. If I go into a modern theater and just strike up a conversation with theater artisans, uh, you know, a lot of them are not going to know some of these terms that um, the textbook is going. So I'm going to move pretty fast and jump around a lot and uh, definitely don't expect you to know everything in these chapters exhaustively because your textbook authors are pretty thorough. Um, that said, the information's there if it interests you. Like I said, I think it's pretty fascinating, especially if you're a history buff. Um, but, you know, for the sake of time for this course, we'll, we'll try to move a little more quickly and only give you a snapshots of a few times and places, uh, many of which we've already talked about. This ends up, by the time we get to this point in the semester, you've already heard me talk about uh, Dionysus, for example. If you remember, he is the god of wine and sex and... Uh, blurred lines, as Robin Thicke would say, uh, god of theater, you know, what's real, what's not real, is that a character, is that an actor, is that, um, is this reality, or am I just drunk, so Dionysus is the god of blurred lines, one of my favorite moments in Aristophanes, uh, the frogs, is when Dionysus has a hangover, and he comes in, and the frogs are ribbiting too loud and they're singing their praises to Apollo and uh, he's arguing with them about how they should be quieter. Eventually Dionysus farts really loudly and shuts up all of the frogs with his astounding ability to fart. He was drinking all night at the festival Dionysia and he had party butt. So you know a lot of us think of religion as something sacred. Our um, priests or preachers probably don't talk about uh, Jesus farts often. So w when we talk about these gods or goddesses, they have a different dynamic than what a lot of us would think about our current religious, if you are a religious person, I don't mean to presume. Um, but Dionysia definitely, as a festival, had a reputation right? It was the festival of wine. It was um, not uncommon for prostitutes to be there uh, for, from what some historical records indicate. And we always have to go about theater history with an ounce of humility. You know, I, I um, listened to a series of lectures once where they, you know, talked about how a lot of what uh, historians do is they speculate. So, you know, if we God forbid, had some nuclear disaster and someone found the golden arches, they might suspect that they're temples and we all, you know, worshipped the god of golden arches when really it's just McDonald's signs and that's just where we ate. <laughs> you know, weird things in ancient Grecian cultures, there were a lot of clay um, phalluses, penises, that were hung on fences. What what do we make of that? Uh, was that just the popular decor? Uh, was it part of a religious, uh, we, you know, we don't know. So we speculate about such things. We try to fill in the gaps. We know there's a lot of revisionist history out there of people rewriting these scripts in translation to say what they want to say. So we take it all with a grain of salt and a little bit of humility and uh, still try to imagine what it was like to be there because it's pretty fascinating. Speaking of uh, male genitalia, I apologize for those of you who are faint of heart, uh, but the uh, it's hard to capture the Greek and Roman style of theater without a little bit of nudity. Uh, so for those of you who are Percy Jackson fans, you know satyrs, uh, although he was fully clothed in the movies at least. Um, satyrs were uh, mythological creatures that followed pan and uh, they you know were often up to no good with fairies. If you saw Hercules, Danny DeVito's character was a satyr. Um, and 
they are rowdy. Like I said, they follow Pan. They follow this um, god of chaos, this god of wilderness. And uh, they were half man, half goat. It wasn't uncommon for them to wear puppet penises, uh, overly large um, uh, puppet genitalia in order to tell these crass and silly stories. They came at the end of these long, serious days. So we talked about, you know, uh, Oedipus is in this chapter, if I had followed the book exactly to the letter, we would be talking about Oedipus today. Uh, But by the time you get through with this story of incest and uh, patricide and, uh, you know, deep, painful mythology of your culture, you you know, you you don't mind a few penis jokes. (laughs) Um, And, uh, but there was a lot of crassness going on, and we'll we'll get to how um, that led to its demise, right? So um, we talked about the tragedians, we talked about uh, Er, um, Aeschylus and uh, Sophocles, Uh, but there were some comedians too. Probably our first uh, comedian that we think of that was heavily celebrated is Aristophanes, and uh, this is a illustration from a dear friend of mine, my former professor at Austin P. directed this play, and I just thought the pick art for it was too cool. Um... But Aristophanes, he wrote the birds, he wrote uh, the frogs, which I just mentioned, and he also wrote a play uh, called Lysistrata, which was an anti-war play. He he believed that the wars that um, Greece was embarking in uh, were overreaching, that they, you know, get away without fighting those wars, they were unnecessary. And in the play, all the women go on strike. They're not going to sleep with their husbands until the war is over. Um, and uh, just a really silly play, uh, but also, you know, a strong power to the people kind of message. So um, Aristophanes, you know, it wasn't all sadness. It wasn't all uh, dark, deep, painful things, especially towards the end of um this uh, golden age of ancient Greece, but I feel like we've talked about ancient Greece so much in every single lecture that you guys get the point, right? By now, you're you're pretty well saturated. Y- you know, the, it's funny to me that they have like chorus and um, all of that kind of thing in here because it feels like we've already kind of talked about that uh, in other chapters. So I forgot to put trilogy in there, um, but I kind of touched on it when I talked about satyrs, that there were three plays often um, in a row, and then that satyr play at the end. All right, moving on to Roman theater, and for those of you who know, that's Marcel Marceau standing in a Picasso uh, art exhibit there. Marcel Marceau is French, not, um, not, not ancient Roman, but he represents pantomime. When a lot of us think about good pantomime, I can just sit and watch YouTube videos of Marcel Marceau uh, and in awe. Uh, he just moves his bodies in, in ways that, to me, it's like a dance and uh, it's poetry. And it's, you know, mime can be silly, mime can be fun. If you've ever had a street performer uh, approach you on the street, sometimes it can be uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, but also, Mime can be moving, deeply moving. We're communicating with visual language, and in some ways it's the most rudimentary style. Uh, Back in the ancient Roman time and up through the Middle Ages, it was definitely considered sort of a fluffier kind of endeavor. It was not taken seriously, and um, mimes would be employed in courts. Uh, You know, they'd have a court jester. He would often do mime and uh, sleight of hand magic and such. Um, originally, back in ancient Rome, it was sung, and one male dancer would uh, act out this mythology while there was a chorus um, singing and an orchestra playing. It was really more what we would think of in modern times of a lyrical dance, but it evolved over time to be something, um, just any, anything without words. Uh, any sort of movement without words. But if you say mime or pantomime to a theater artist today, they're going to think of uh, short bits, you know, with juggling and or um, abil- ability to, you know, manipulate your hands. And that, to still to this day, Rome, Paris, those are the training centers for clowns and mimes, right? Um, and uh, it is definitely a whole art form. So, 
I always, when I, you know, teach acting, I always require a mime series because in some ways it is the the basis of acting. We have to be able to use our bodies to tell a story even without words um, because that's just half of the game, right? So opening up yourself to that side of things is really important. And some of my favorite comedians, um, David Hyde Pierce, for example, on uh, Frasier had a whole scene of his pants catching on fire and just his physical reactions, no words. Um, and there were several moments in Frasier where he would have these sort of silent uh, sections with music playing in the background, but with him just pantomiming something that were absolutely hilarious. Um, Mr. I uh, can't remember his name right this second, of course. He's a British guy. Mr. Oh, well, doesn't really matter. There are lots of pantomime artists that can be very funny, very serious. They can communicate all sorts of things, but it was definitely something existing in Rome. There is the Colosseum. Um, Rome grew in its entertainments. Obviously, a lot of us, we think ancient Rome, we think of the horrible martyred Christians being eaten by lions in the Colosseum, and that was definitely part of it. Although you can see the cross there, uh, Rome has now repurposed it, uh, which they talk about more thoroughly in your book. But, um, you know, in Grecian times, it was sexual, but it was also sacred. It was, it was for men only. It was a really only certain times of year when it would happen. And while they still had uh, these theater festivals to Jupiter, they still had these sort of religious festivals, borrowing heavily from the Grecian model that they conquered, you know. Um, it was also entertainment was more for everybody women and children came to the theater too but it was also a more of a part of their lives there was entertainment more often they were a wealthy state and um, it was supported by the government and it was a show of power uh, just like our most recently our Trump had a uh, had a big parade celebrating America. You know, something like that would be very much in line with what Rome was doing um, by bringing people together and giving them entertainment as a show of their status and power and wealth. Plautus, I've already mentioned this once before, but he wrote a great play called The Twin Monachamai. When we think of Commedia dell'arte and stock characters and slack slapstick comedy, um, Twins Monachamai is one of the earliest comedies that we have that show proof of uh, these stereotypes that have these tropes that we've seen of twins getting confused for each other. Uh, one twin uh, steals a dress from his wife to give to his mistress, and then the other twin shows up and the mistress finds him and, you know, chaos ensues as it does with these uh, sitcoms with these situational comedies but the twins monachamai uh, is written by Plautus there were other they talk about kind of like late Roman comedies versus early ones and late Roman comedies got more into domestic comedies and were the forebearers like Seneca of um, of Shakespeare's plays Hamlet for example is said to have been borrowed heavily from Seneca and uh, the Renaissance when we get to Shakespeare it was a rediscovery of these Roman and Greek plays and so um, we can't speak enough of how inspired they were by the past and I think you know if you don't take anything else away from this lecture just the idea that you know once again it's all the same stuff uh, nothing new under the sun. These are stories of love. These are stories of family um, and uh, anti-war plays. You know, almost all cultures have them. Uh, either propagation, not propagation, sorry. I'm talking a lot about sex today. Um, either uh, propaganda or or uh, anti, you know, these major themes, the things that people are thinking about, the things they're going to write plays about. And Rome uh, was a very sophisticated, if not brutal, culture that, uh, and it's worth saying too that, that Seneca put the violence on the stage, you know, <laughs> not going to slaughter some Christians and then have a play and not show the violence in it. Uh, there was definitely not the same sort of reverence for the poetic language and the descriptions of violence that there was in the Grecian plays. So, um, so if you're a political science person or a Hunger Games fan, you may have heard of um, Panem et Circenses, and that is um, bread and circus. And Panem in, in the Hunger Games is is the 
elite area where the contestants have to battle for their lives. And it's based on this very famous political quote, which is, um, already long ago from when we sold our vote to no man, talking about the power of democracy and how people used to have convictions and show up at the polls, um, the people have abdicated our duties. For the people who once upon a time handed out military command, high civic office, legions, everything now restrains itself and anxiously hopes for just two things, bread and circuses. So whereas we used to take our government seriously, where we used to live in reality and stay present in the pain and, and problems of our nation, now we just distract ourselves with bread and circus. And it's not uncommon to see politicians sort of take this angle, you know, rather than dealing with the real issues of things, they'll, um, you know, offer, offer something celebratory, something light and fluffy to distract us from what's really going on, right? And some people would argue that part of the reason Rome fell is because people fell asleep at the wheel, right? They got big and they got uh, distracted and the people suffered. But, you know, I am no political genius. I, I'm merely passing on messages that I have heard before. Uh, I really love the Hunger Games series. Anybody else? Man, I mean, I need to go back and reread that. Such a good, uh, such a good story. So readable. So uh, vivid. So, Panem et Circenses. There's Tertullian. Great church father. Uh, ever heard of uh, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil? Uh, Tertullian had some weird beliefs. Uh, he was a, a great church father, as I said, but he believed that uh, in asceticism, he believed, um, you know, let's hurt ourselves. The more suffering that we go through, the closer we become to God. He believed that if a man ejaculated, part of his soul left his body in his ejaculation. Just some real oddball stuff, but but some some really um, theologically respected church father in many ways. I'm pointing to the oddities because I have a weird, you know, sensibility and sense of humor, but uh, once again, 284 is sort of a contentious date. Some people would say it was a different time, but, uh, you know, once again, insert rant about McDonald's and we don't really know anyway and we have to be humble about such things, but... Um, Never mind the themes of the shows being these pantomimes with penis puppets. There were also, by that time, lots of temple prostitutes. And, um, you know, people would ritualistically eat a lot and then throw it back up. Just a culture of excess and entertainment to distract rather than enter entertainment to educate. Um, Horace, a Roman... Um, uh, critic, kind of the way Aristotle was, really believed that we could use theater as a tool to educate, but obviously uh, a lot of the playwrights at that time were not, and the pantomimes were not taking that advice, because there's lots of, and obviously they're killing Christians in these same buildings where they're doing uh, these performances, and they're doing them in honor of Roman gods, so it's part of their worship, uh, what Tertullian would have thought of as pagan worship, so he also had this belief, Tertullian did, that uh, if you saw something evil, it would infect your eyes and infect your body, uh, that it could travel, the evil could, you know, travel. And, I, you know, I do think that sounds crazy, bonkers, uh, but I do think there's a certain amount of, it, of wisdom to guarding what you see. You know, I don't think our brains were, you know, I wake up first thing in the morning, I pull open Instagram while I'm using the bathroom and I see, you know, uh, 15 different images, one friend who's traveling, another friend, uh, you know, um, posting a graphic image of her favorite horror show, you know, and I, those, that barrage of images is not the way that my little beastie brain was created to, uh, you know, wired to survive, and um, there's a lot of interesting evidences about how pictures kind of affect our brains and affect our uh, psychology, and so, um, Anyway, it's just a interesting, you know, I grew up in a very conservative uh, family and I was definitely sheltered and, um, and uh, I, you know, I 
am not as as much that way anymore but I do think still think that I need to protect my child in his eyes and uh, I'm not completely writing Tertullian's wisdom off not saying that there's some supernatural evil that's uh, got me once I see something evil but um, interesting food for thought anyway for those of us who are spiritual loophole always loophole isn't there so the um there used to be big parades in Rome to celebrate um, Julius Caesar, to p- celebrate what they believed to be a demigod, the, the chosen sun god. And then they turned around uh, and after Rome was converted, they turned around and did those same parades to Jesus, right? And uh, still to this day, if you go down to Mardi Gras, if you go down to Louisiana, which is my old stomping grounds in, in, on the coast at least, um, they're still having those parades today that are put on uh, during these high holy days, during a Mardi Gras before the season of Lent, as a time of excess and celebration. And those are rooted in these, uh, you know, ancient rituals of parades that reach all the way back to Roman times. So those parades lived on, even as theater was banned and shut down by the church fathers. Uh, parades were still legal, even, even though there were costumes and sets and a lot of the same things we would expect from a theater performance. So when I say the church shut it down, you could not get a Christian burial if you were a minstrel, performer, juggler, actor. You uh, Even up until Shakespeare's day, you still had to petition for a, a Christian burial if you were performing in the theater arts um, because of this judgment from the church fathers and because of the suspected link between prostitution and uh, theater that's always sort of existed. Um, so when we get to religious theater, it died for a long time, but it was reborn. Uh, of course, we have the Dark Ages. We have this time of of horrible plague, of horrible um, illiteracy and, uh, you know, wealth disparity and pain and poverty among the people. And so we have... Uh, beautiful windows that help tell the stories of uh, the Bible. And um, if you went to Mass, if you went to church, the only kind of church they had then in the Western world was um, often in Latin. That wasn't meant to alienate the audiences, but of course it did. Um, Part of what happened is that language wasn't really coded until Napoleon. So the words that you spoke are just whatever your parents spoke. And language uh, of traveling from, you know, these little pockets where people maybe never traveled outside of, you know, 50 miles of where they were born, uh, the language could be completely different two villages over. So the priests and everyone educated was taught Latin. And so Latin was supposed to be sort of this language that unified the people, but of course it alienated the poor. So we start with... Um, Christian plays being performed in Latin in during the ceremonies. Um, but ev- eventually we get into doing plays in the vernacular of the people. But for the same reason that they created stained glass windows, they would do these little plays with gestures. So the Quayam Quertus, one of the first ones, which is, um, you know, the Mother Mary being visited by an angel who's telling her that she's pregnant. Uh, you know, we've got the, the pantomime of the angel putting its hand on, you know, Mary's stomach and, and kind of telling the story visually for those people who didn't understand what was going on. They were just trying to get to their next meal. Um, so theater has resurfaced in festivals and um, it's being performed by uh, by tradespeople, by everyday people. Nobody wants to be a professional actor really because they wouldn't get a Christian burial. It was frowned on by the church and the power structure. Remember the church was not just a place they went on Sunday. It was also part of the um, governing uh, the government and, and part of the way that people were educated was through the church. Um, by far the most commonly performed play is the crucifixion of Christ, uh, or as Catholics call it, the passion. Um, I say Catholics, some, some, um, some Protestants call it the passion as well, which just means the pain of Christ. Um, and it's still probably the most performed play in the world. And if you go to some cool old cities in Europe or Spain, you can still see the passion depicted. It can be a little bit controversial because often they do, um, 
once again rely, rely on that asceticism that they actually whip the person playing Jesus or they actually hang the person um, playing Judas. And so uh, it can be kind of dangerous and people actually get hurt. Uh, and it's sort of grotesque to watch. So uh, nothing draws a crowd like a little blood. So during the Middle Ages, these festival days, like the Feast of St. John, for example, uh, these tradespeople uh, would get together and have a fun festivals in the streets, and they would have um, these stages set up where they would act out, obviously, angels and devils, as you see here. Uh, like I said, the theater was shut down, but there were still pantomimes, uh, people who were traveling jugglers and jesters and such, but um, not any sort of formal theater as we would think it today in, in the West. So we had two types of plays, uh, at least, but we had mystery plays, which depicted scenes from the Bible. Uh, it's worth mentioning, you know, we know the names of Aristophanes and Seneca and Plautus, but we don't know a lot of these um, these monks and nuns who were writing these plays because uh, they had a anthem to God alone be the Gloria. Uh, sorry, mixing my Latin with my English. To God alone be the glory. In other words, they wouldn't take any credit for their writing. Uh, we do know that Horst Vita, she, a German nun, wrote plays that we were not sure were ever performed, but most of the nuns and uh, tradespeople who would be writing these plays didn't take any credit for what they were writing. Now some of these Bible stories were interpreted in a way that we kind of look back on and cringe, right? Uh, for those of you who, who are religious, um, you know, you probably know the, the story of Abraham and Isaac, for example, which is Abraham killing Isaac, uh, taking him up to a mountaintop to sacrifice him at the last minute. A scapegoat comes out and he can kill the goat, but Abraham was willing to kill his son um, in, in order to please God without blind obedience, really knowing what was going on. And of course, it was that theme of blind obedience that kept the masses, uh, you know, the servants down. Uh, you know, they just would do whatever they're told, no, no matter that uh, they're, the lords they were serving were making so much more money than them, and they were starving, and they were blindly marching into these battles all the way to uh, the Holy Lands uh, to fight wars that they didn't really know what was going on. So, you know, some of these mystery plays are beautiful, and some of them um, uh, profess maybe politics or religious views that we would consider very outdated today. Um, Every Man, though, is still one of those plays that, that I choke up when I when I read it. Um, it's an allegory. We have every man, and he comes to his death, and he loses his discretion, his ability to make decisions. He loses his beauty. He loses his wealth. Um, but his good deeds live on after him. And I like to think, when I kick the bucket, that um, the good work that I do, uh, loving people and in the theater and, uh, you know, through charity work, that, that those good deeds live on after me and that I've made the world a better place. And so Every Man is still one of my favorites of all time. And it's written in rhyming couplets and it feels um, very overt. Remember, the, the masses were illiterate, so it was not a... Uh, you know, he says things like, every man says things like, and now I die, <laughs> right? Uh, not a lot of subtlety uh, to to the storytelling of it, um, but deep and meaningful nonetheless, even though it may be a bit overt. Um, you can see that this picture I've chosen is in German, and uh, when we talk about these villages, you know, we're talking about all over Europe and Spain. So one of the tools that they would use in these, um, like I said, they had uh, basically parades that they would do with mansions. The mansions, um, I'm trying to find my page number here, bear with, bear with. Uh, these mansions, and you can see a page on, a, a picture on page 280. Um, these mansions were, uh, something that they would have kind of like a living nativity where you could go from stage to stage and see cycles of cycle plays. Um, you could see biblical stories, for example, in the one they have pictured here, you know, there's heaven on one end and hell on the other. And so um, you get these sort of poking uh, 
passing pictures, kind of like a living nativity where you just kind of drive by and see Mother Mary holding somebody's kid. Um, the pageant wagon uh, was another device that they used. People, actors would change underneath the wagon and then go up to perform. And here we can see the Quarum Quartus, the uh, angel coming to tell Mother Mary that she's pregnant. Um, these uh, pageant wagons, um, we're not really sure whether they moved or not or whether they stood still while these actors performed. But like I said, these were often, this was outdoor theater and it was happening during festivals. And even when we get into Commedia dell'arte, they're still using these pageant wagons. These families uh, would you know, travel from city to city and, and use these pageant wagons as their mode of transportation. They'd get, climb up there and act it out. So. so we said that groups of people were putting on these shows and um, we know that like different trades groups. So all the black welders would get together and put on a hell's mouth where they're showing smoke and, you know, using heat to tell the story of hell. And then all the fish shipbuilders would be putting on Noah's Ark, you know, so they would use the tools of their trade to, um, and, and what they knew to sort of tell these stories in fun and lively ways for their communities. I say fun, hell, you know, <laughs> uh, but we still have judgment houses today. I mean, it's, it's funny with this church stuff, how, you know, the tradition continues thousands of years after it initiated. So judgment houses, if you've never gone at Halloween time and they sort of, um, in some way depict hell in a way that's scary. And so, so we've talked a little bit about the ancient theater up to the medieval times in the West. So let's move to the East, particularly Japan, China, and India. Uh, this is where it got a little tricky and I had to um, we're moving into chapter 12, but then I also kind of had to jump to the end of this uh, book to talk about some other kind of styles of theater that I wanted to, to cover. So I'm going to speak in oversimplification, and let me just apologize. This is overly simple and um, not altogether accurate. It's more of a rule of thumb. Eastern theater is beautiful. The women are makeup and huge wigs and shimmering costumes. I say the women, the men too, uh, you know, in these Katakali plays when they're depicting uh, these Hindi gods and they've got, you know, head to foot uh, regalia and, you know, not even their hands are showing uh, and they're dance drama based. And so the movements are poetic um, for them to you know, ancient Eastern theater, if they had shown up at like a Shakespeare play and just sat and listened to somebody read, uh, not read, uh, you know, elocute to, to speak words, they would have been like, what? What are we, is this a theater? What are we doing? Um, it, very different as to what they valued. And once again, I think that Aristotle helped guide that ship as opposed to, uh, you know, Eastern drama probably would appreciate Broadway because it's, you know, beautiful and image, visual right, in general, more visual language. Mythic. When you're reading these play synopsis of Asian theater, uh, a god or goddess shows up uh, in kabuki theater, somebody's going to turn into a fox and be, uh, you know, magically not a fox anymore as they're dying in somebody's lap. So uh, not afraid to enter the world of, uh, you know, I'm thinking about the monkey king, and he, he can... Um, his legs turn into these huge, and he can, you know, leap miles and miles with the stride of one foot. And so there's always something happening that's larger than life. They're more likely to include mu uh, puppets and um, masks and mythic elements uh, rather than a, a show like Raisin in the Sun, where we're sitting around ironing and eating biscuits, uh, eating our eggs. You know, they're thinking in general more mythically. Eastern theater, um, depending on the art form, and I, once again, I don't want to over uh, simplify or over generalize. Eastern th theater tends to be more about the combat or the dance or the depiction of the, you know, depths of despair of this romantic relationship rather than um, 
action event, consequence, action event, consequence. Um, you know, that's not as much where most Asian theater is. In fact, I do a group work with my honors classes uh, where they have to analyze the plot as one of their assignments. And um, I had a a student um, summer who was analyzing the monkey king and she kind of came to me and she's like um it's really hard for me to answer a lot of these questions because it just doesn't tick the boxes the same way that a lot of western theater does eastern theater tends to begin training um, it's often a family affair or an orphan uh, will be sort of adopted by a theater troupe and they start the training very very young so um in Eastern theater, you're expected to, you know, jump off a chair, backflip, land in the splits, and then hit the high note. <laughs> if you're an actor, uh, it's a lot of skills-based learning. Um, memorizing these um, dance routines can happen very, very young that they start training for these things, uh, as opposed to, you know, me, who didn't decide I was going to do theater till I was like, you know, 19, 18. So... The training is much more rigorous and it begins as a child often. So you've been assigned to go watch these videos and um, one of them, I know, I'm sorry that they're in the scope of a larger, uh, a larger documentary and so you have to begin by watching this wonky thing about um, Japanese ballerinas. I apologize for that. Uh, but in the clip that I showed you of Japanese no, you see how slow right this is an extension of um, religion you can see how they're very intentionally have this heel toe way that they walk and it's very percussive and thoughtful and contemplative and poetic and see already I'm breaking the things that I said it's not intellectual no it definitely is a um, rigidly traditional things this is one of the this is really the only that I know of style of dance drama that has been preserved exactly as it was performed thousands of years ago. It's really kind of fascinating. In fact, the the year that this textbook gives is, is not the same one that other works that I've worked with have said. Um, so once again, McDonald's insert rant about the nature of speculative um, understanding of things. But... Uh, Japanese no is part of a religious ritual that began with stomping and um, these monks use it to train their mind and uh, to be present in the moment and once again that that idea that when they put on that mask that it inhabits them and they're speaking as their ancestor as the god or goddess they're depicting and uh trying to find the page forgive me <clears throat> you can see that your textbook spells no with a little line over the o not trying to be lazy um, but I've always seen it seen it in oh so I'm just gonna stick with it um, and they're still considered like if you go uh, like Steve Jobs to some Shinto uh, meditation center in rural Japan that no is often a part of the program it's a part a way for people to connect and unplug and center themselves is through this um, gliding sort of dance drama it's it's meant to be meditative it's meant to be thoughtful so I will say it's not hugely popular from what I understand um, I, you know at least once again limited scope I've never even been to Japan except for a layover on my way to China but from what I understand it's kind of like opera today a lot of people, you know, aren't 100% in. Kabuki, on the other hand, which was heavily influenced by No, is very popular and can be found on many, many um, big cities in Japan are, are still doing Kabuki plays. And they're relying on a lot of the same myths. They're just telling them in a way uh, with more acrobatics, with more dance and popular music. They tend to be more erotic and romantic in nature. Um, they started by a Shinto priestess and were actually um, shut down and we talked about this a little bit when I talked about Mei uh, Lanfang and how you know it went to being performed by uh, men but then those men were being prostituted so uh, they opened it up once again to be performed by women because there was just no getting around it. Uh, but Kabuki is um, 
weird, delightfully weird. Uh, like I said, somebody is a fox, uh, turned into a fox, and there's all these trap doors and acrobatics and sword play and larger than life. If you go into a Japanese restaurant and see the woodcuts on the wall, the posters with beautiful um, makeup women, uh, often they're depicting great actors. You're basically looking at a Time magazine <laughs> with an actor or actresses uh, likening, you know, p painted on it because a lot of these woodblock prints harken back to a kabuki actor. Um, and so uh, highly celebrated and mostly preserved. Now, the kabuki clip that I gave you for this one, I know, is more meditative and these are star-crossed lovers who are about to kill themselves for love. Uh, it wasn't the you know, I was working with what I could find. Uh, but like I said, Kabuki and No are not can wholly unalike. They they definitely share the same root. They are flowers on the same tree. So Katakali. And like I said, this is where we had to uh, dance around a little bit. Forgive the pun. 213 is not the right page number. I apologize. Let me see. Ah, ah, ah. Anybody got a joke? Let me look this up real quick. The right page number is four ten. 410. So I apologize for that. I had to skip all the way to the end of the book to be able to kind of organize it the way my mind's eye organizes it. So once again, 213 is actually 410. And ooh, that's a great picture on that page. The, the picture I got somehow got a little blurry between me cutting it off the internet and putting it in my PowerPoint slide. I apologize for that. But the, the picture on 410 really shows you the nuance of that makeup and it takes them hours to get into that makeup every night. Um, it's, Katakali is often performed at night. Once again, keeping it humble, I've never actually seen Katakali. Um, sometimes the shows go on and on and on. They're long uh, because they're telling these epic stories, these larger than life um stories of priests and uh, gods and the clip that I showed you um, shows those very distinct eyebrow movements and I don't fully pretend to understand uh, why those eyebrow movements are so pivotal to understanding the characters um, but the stylized headdresses are also a big part of the Katakali dance dramas and Every step, and this is not just in Katakali, but in a lot of Eastern theater, um, you memorize the exact same steps as the person before you. So in Eastern theater, we have somebody like Hamlet. They're going to play Hamlet different than Kevin Klein's Hamlet. Uh, Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch's Hamlet's going to be very different from, um, from Kevin Klein's Hamlet. Whereas in these Eastern dramas, it's not about the ego. It's not about the performer doing something creative. It's about them um, learning the steps and the parts as they're historically and traditionally preserved. So um, I would love to go watch Sanskrit drama and I, drama and I, you know, they um, use these gestures, these very distinct gestures to help. And these are going on in India. I also thought it was sad in the description in the textbook when they were talking about the pillars and how if you were in a certain caste, if you were in a certain financial, uh, you know, um, vocational uh, place in life, you had to sit in certain areas of the theater. Harken back to me of, you know, Jim Crow and our separations. But, oh, every culture is different, unfortunately. So, Beijing Opera. Beijing Opera is... Um, a very distinct form of uh, it started as Peking opera, something that was performed even for the royalty. The emperor was how it was created. It was performed in the courts. A lot of the stories told stories of war and um, people honoring the emperors. It doesn't 
traditionally have a lot of lights or scenery and there are tropes like that guy holding that green you know what looks like a big stick to us if he started doing a certain gesture of paddling in the water then everybody would know that he was in a boat uh, so the genre has adapted for the fact that there's not scenery or, or lighting effects although the video clip that you saw there's a you know beautifully ornate interior stage and we can imagine that a lot of these palaces were the same way they, you know same as the other forms we've looked at it's those ornate wigs and embroidered robes are definitely um, hallmarks of the Beijing opera water sleeves so you see how that sleeve um, goes well beyond her hand if you ever want to waste some time on YouTube you can watch the uh, water sleeve dances they look like when large groups of people perform them together there they look like a wave they look uh, very poetic in motion heavily make up once again they were performed by men for a certain time and then eventually turned back over to females which they reference in the little documentary clip that I gave you uh, expected to be able to do acrobatic work sword play um, play musical instruments all of these are the demands on these Beijing operas and like I said the monkey king is is probably the most famous um, now unfortunately when the revolution happened uh, Mao shut down all of these operas because they were created as court dramas and a lot of them had you know language in them just like I was talking about Abraham and Isaac and sort of this um, religion as a manipulation of the masses you know the Beijing opera was propaganda for the court uh, you know uh, emperor worship basically and so that was ideally different and if you don't know anything about China and um, I had the pleasure this last semester of having a student um, who was from China and she just shared so much with me about about Beijing and um, uh, her father was a professor and he was uh, killed by Mao's army and uh, such a violent revolution and uh, you know her town um, as did many suffered their crops suffered and more people died in that revolution than all of World War II combined um, but mostly through just starvation uh, it's a very dark time um, if you if you uh, have the energy to research it um, but these uh, band operas they were then kind of rewritten and played on the stereo as a propaganda tool and um, often the groups of people it fell out of favor and they talk about that in the clip that they you know said that we've got this new rebirth of opera and that's what they're speaking to is sort of uh, you know got abused by Mao and his wife um, at least from my perspective it got abused and then um, begin to grassroots kind of come up from the people again as opposed to something that was being forced down their throats so Beijing opera is ornate it's beautiful it has a very nasal quality which you probably noticed in the uh, a falsetto voice that's very different from what we would think of opera in the West so a lot of ground today and I'm sorry that I jumped around so much and got the wrong page number on 410 uh, but I hope you feel like you've been on a little traveling circus that you've gotten to see some things different from what we expect and what we've talked about so far um, you know it's very humbling to see all of this information about theater history and so much that we um, so much that we have documented and that we have celebrated it just speaks to the importance of theater as a cultural icon as a reflection of culture and so um, I hope I didn't offend anyone today I talked a lot about religion I talked a lot uh, you know showed some nudity for example um, but it's a college level course and uh, thank you for sticking with it till the end as always thank you for listening